Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Bunch of Apes podcast. I am your host, Sam Harris, and I am on a journey of discovery through prehistory. Uh, so I am delighted to be joined today by Bernie Taylor, who um, is a uh, independent naturalist, thought leader, and author. Bernie, I would really like you to start by just explaining what an independent naturalist and thought leader is and does and how you came to be such I mean that's a fantastic title by the way I'm very envious well I'm not the first one with that title you have a few distinguished um, Britons with that title of course um, Charles Darwin oh okay was that Charles oh, oh naturalist yeah yeah okay yeah he was a naturalist he looked at the natural world he looked at the, the birds of course um, and he looked at plants in his garden and he came to conclusions about how the world could be. Um, another one, of course, is Jane Goodall. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. J- Jane Goodall started out by learning from her dog. Okay, if you know the story, you've heard the story. I only <laughs> and, know uh, her work with the chimpanzees and things like that. I didn't know she started with a dog. She started with a dog. She says her best teacher was her dog. Wow. Um, then she went down to, um, to Africa, hooked up with Leaky. And then they, he sent her off to Tanzania to work with the chimpanzee. And she, she approached the chimpanzees as animal beings. That's really important. She didn't weigh and measure chimpanzees. She categorized them by families and she gave them names, which is the ultimate taboo in wildlife <laughs> biology. Because you, you're not supposed to associate, become familiar with, and to feel um, and have empathy for the animal beings. And that's what Jane Goodall did. And that which, that's what makes her a naturalist. It's the difference between a, I call wildlife biologist and a naturalist, um, or an evolutionary biologist and a naturalist, is that one is, one is looking at the, the naturalist is looking at the big picture, looking at all the pieces of the puzzle, and the naturalist becomes part of the story. Whereas an evolutionary biologist is looking at the story from a distance, um, as is a wildlife biologist. Um, who doesn't, you know, feel empathy. I mean, they, they do feel empathy for the animals, but they, they emotionally distance themselves from the animals. Mm. And, and we come from, we, we had emotions before we had thinking. So if you look at all the other animal beings in our, in our world and chimpanzee, chimpanzees are, are smart, but they're not great thinkers. They're highly emotional beings. Mm. And that's where we come from. So the chimpanzees are, are you know, a step to two, two, three beyond them are the naturalist. And then many steps beyond that becomes the thinking evolutionary biologist. And to truly understand who we are, where we come from, is you have to look through the eyes of a naturalist. The naturalist is also a shaman. And the shaman in Native American traditions and in Africa, in South, South America, these are people that believe the mountains are real. They believe the, the wind has a voice. They believe that the animals are their brothers and sisters. That is the mind of a naturalist. And that's the mind of Jane Goodall when she started naming chimpanzees and the wildlife biologist threw up their arms and said, you can't do that, you can't do that because that's, what's, that's not what wildlife biologists do. And she said, well, I'm not a wildlife biologist. I'm not a primatologist, I'm a naturalist. And so I will give names to um, animals, animal beings that I see in the Paleolithic caves just as people did in the distant past. And that's a difference between a naturalist and a wildlife biologist. Now the naturalist has to use the same tools as a wildlife biologist and an evolutionary biologist and the many other disciplines in archeology span and anthropology. But the, it's about becoming immersed um, in the subject and looking at it from many different directions. Right, I love that. That's, I think I want to be a naturalist now. You definitely sold it to me. Because I always thought, <laughs> it's like, you know, archaeology, I've, I've, I've spoken to a couple of archaeologists, some, some paleoanthropologists, um, and some of them, you know, are great. And uh, Brianna Pobner, who I did an episode with recently, she, she's very good at balancing the sort of scientific consideration, but also some big idea thinking. Mm-hmm. But sometimes, you know, you'll ask a question like, well, do you think that meant that they maybe pondered what was in the 
you know, across the sea. And that's why they, you know, and, and, and archaeologists and, and some people in the more scientific fields were just not, well, we don't have any evidence for that. So we, can't. we don't have it. Exactly, exactly. It's t- that's the way it is. And uh, so we have evidence for what people do, you know, maybe. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. So if, if an archaeologist or Egyptologist uncovers a very old Egyptian tomb, from that early tomb, they can learn or have a better understanding of how the, the, the um, other tombs came to be, both before and after that. And, the psych- and a bit about the psychology of the people during that time period. Um, Carl Jung, the Swiss psychoanalyst, as well as um, Sigmund Freud, they both studied Egyptian artifacts. They, they collected them. Because in their time, in the 1800s, that was the most, those were the most significant artifacts from early in time to better understand the human psyche. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then bef- just about that time, or actually just after we had um, unearthed Gil- um, the Epic of Gilgamesh in the, uh, the oldest story that we knew at the time from the sands of what is now Iraq. And that told a story about a hero on his journey. And on his journey has all kinds of trials and tribulations and the Noah's, the Noah's flood stories on that. And so prior to my work, um, we were looking, you know, thousands of years, you know, let's say 6,000 years ago to Gilgamesh. And we said that this is the mind of people during that time period. And perhaps it was the mind before that time, but we just don't know, just as an archaeologist would say. We don't have the, the data. What we're doing with my work is we're going back tens of thousands of years. We're going back before Egyptology. We're going before before the Native American migration from Siberia to North America. We're going before the migrations of people from, um, let's say, Eurasia into further Indonesia, and perhaps people who um, were connected into Australia. So we're going into the deepest psyche of mankind. We're, this is the dream of Sigmund Freud and, and Carl Jung, that we can look so far back in time. And we can just look so far back in time before all these migrations and the earliest um, record of humanity, we can go deep into the psyche. And we can learn about all of us, not what separates us, but what is the common element between us. So if we look at an artifact in Egypt we, or in, in the um, in South America or in Central America, North America, we can find common elements of them that explain how they came to be. Because the root, those are the branches of a tree whose roots are deep in the Paleolithic in these upper cave art images. I think, um, so we, we, we're going ahead a little bit because I haven't actually explained to anyone or la- allowed you the space to explain the work you're doing. But, but I will come on to that because um, what you're saying absolutely fascinates me and it's something I've think, thought about a lot in, in prehistory from, from a slightly different perspective because um, I'm a bit of a, because of my, my job, uh, I'm interested in uh, neurological studies and things like that. And I've, I've read a few books about the neurological development of the human species. And, and I read something once that was kind of suggesting that in terms of the, you know, the, the finds of... Uh, homo sapiens you know the brain probably hasn't changed much for 200,000 years or you know 150 mm-hmm. thousand years and yet as you say the first sort of recorded writing we have epic of Gilgamesh 6,000 years ago but cave art kind of springing into being what 40,000 odd years ago mm-hmm. and for us to assume that then by some in some way those people just weren't thinking you know weren't considering things pondering things telling stories to each other sharing emotions and experiences in this in similar ways to we are now i I think is a little bit naive i I think there must have been something going on but we perhaps we just don't have the evidence for it and absence of evidence is not evidence of absence um but just i I wanted to you got to tell that to the archaeologist that you get on your program just let you know that well put that one out there (laughs) So she, she agrees, uh, but she's a paleoanthropologist. <laughs> just to, so just if I give my loose summary of, of what I think it is that your most recent work is about, and then you can obviously you know, give the detail, but um, you have been studying the caves in, where was it again? It's in, in France and Spain. France and Spain. So again, these are early, um, they're the earliest cave yes. markings or paintings we have. Um Again, made by we think by Homo sapiens. Um, there yes. would have been Neanderthals around at that time, but 
I think they, they were not made by by Neanderthals, correct? Right, they're made by. However, sex. however, there was um, Neanderthal Homo sapien mixing at the time. Yes, yeah, a lot of inter interspecies breeding. Don't get me started on that. Have you seen the sloping forehead? You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you then you you looked at these caves and you saw these images that were being shared. And we know that the images were being shared of animals and things like that. But you also, um, you referenced uh, some evidence that the early, was it the Greeks had visited those caves as well? Greeks, Mesopotamians and others, yes. And and your 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 book really is about how, sorry, what's the title of the, I should have done really Before rubbish. Orion, Finding Before. the Face of the Hero. That's it, finding the face of the earth. And, and your book kind of posits the idea that these stories that came to prominence in the sort of ancient Greek times about heroes, mythologies, things like that, were actually being told and either being formed or just first recorded way back in the Paleolithic era. Is that yeah, fair? At least 40,000 years ago. So, well, I mean, that's just the first recording. It You could almost argue that, again, they may have been being told for thousands of years before, but we just have those findings in that cave. So, yeah. Uh, I believe it. I believe they were formed hundreds of thousands of years ago. Mm, mm, okay. But so I pushed it back from 40, from 6,000 to 40,000 in, you know, in a heartbeat, you know, <laughs> and no one was expecting that one. And there's no one argues that either. You know, it's indisputable. So, you know, is it so much of a bigger leap to go from 40,000 to 300,000? No. <laughs> yeah, not if you tie it in with the, with the, the, the archaeological evidence that looks at kind of brain um, shapes and, and the development of the brain would suggest, again, that, that, that the brain was pretty similar 150,000 years ago. So, again, you know, what were those people doing? They wouldn't have just been sat around knocking rocks together without pondering things. We know that, like... Uh, certain types of human behavior and thinking come from certain parts of the brain that were again around a hundred thousand years ago. So I would agree. Well, the brain itself, the, you know, the basic structure hasn't changed. How the mix of what's in the soup could be changing. Um, yeah. So my brain, how my brain works and how my wires are, are um, formed may be different from yours. In fact, they are different from yours, okay? Mm -hmm. And yours are different from your accountants and your accountants are different from your lawyers and your lawyer is different from your, the guy, the person who, your plumber. And it's, it's our brain wiring, that our individual brain wiring that gives us unique talents. Um, so we, when we say that we, you know, homo sapiens have had the same brain for hundreds of thousands of millions of years, it, and that is that is that is what is commonly said. It's not a it's not a question. It, it's it's only part of the picture. Um, so if you if you're if um, if Pablo Picasso, um, you know, gave seed to hundreds of thousands of women during his lifetime, and he passed on, um, and those those his children, you know, were fruitful and prospered, uh, multiplied in the biblical sense then you potentially would have millions of incredible artists running around in Spain right now. Do we or know that France? France though? Was he a top shagger? Do we know he was? Oh, he was. Well, yeah, he was. Yeah, that was part of his yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. But he wasn't hundreds of thousands. You know, he was dozens. <laughs> Not Genghis Khan style. <laughs> okay. Ten, ten, a few tens, right? But, we're, but you can imagine hundreds of thousands. Okay. Um, and to really get to hundreds of thousands, you really have to have to go back a few generations to have somebody, you know, a, a prince or a king who, you know, who um, who took domain over his his kingdom. And so, if you did have some of the of the of the, of the talent, artistic talent, the way of thinking of how he was wired, of Pablo Picasso or Renoir or many of the great artists, and they became the primary propagators of of people you would then have over time a population of phenomenally great artists. You might not have a population that can, is very good at your electricity or handling your law or doing your medicine, okay? <laughs> you're, you're, um, but you'd have a, a population of phenomenal artists. And what I think happened, was going on tens of thousands of years ago, is that there was a larger population as a percentage um, of, great artists. And these weren't just, 
these weren't these people were beyond the level of Picasso. I mean, this Picasso had visited some of the Paleolithic caves and he walked away and he said, none of us could have done anything like this. And his work, his first work of uh, Cubism, Le Dem d'Avignon, 1906, 1907, he took, borrowed, I should say, two masks from the, the Spanish cave of Altamira and he put them on the, on the faces of two women. And he was, what he was doing, what he, he, was, he was making the bridge between the distant past and the present. And he borrowed the metaphors of these characters. One apparently looks like the Paleolithic image is a horse, okay? and the other one is unclear. So Picasso bridged the two, and he said, we couldn't do anything like this. And modern art is not modern at all. Mm. It, is a, it, is, it is a redo of upper Paleolithic cave art. So if we had a, if we had a population of Picasso types who, you know, who propagated throughout Europe, we would have a very different... Um, way of envisioning our society and what was important to us, um, where we put our resources. We'd have art all over the place, but we'd also have people who were super creative, revolutionary thinkers, marching in the streets all the time. <laughs> that's okay, um, but that's what would happen. Whereas if we, tens of thousands of years ago, we had people that were really good at making, you know, you know, stone tools. And um, they, were, they were industrious. They made it the same way all the time and they passed that on. Over time, if we had that such person in the, in, you know, the, the 1800s who propagated, you know, Europe, hundreds of thousand people through, you know, in, you know um, in vitro, right? Um, then you would have a population of phenomenal engineers, industrialist people, people who worked well in factories, so while the brain may not have changed the basic structure, I believe that over time, we have set the course in different ways for what was important to us at that time, or we made it important at that time. Hmm. I guess, I mean, I would 100% agree. And, and just to, I guess, to clarify, when I'm saying the structure that our brains were the same 100,000 years ago, it's my understanding that the most unique thing about the human brain compared to say a chimpanzees or other species is its diversity, is its adaptability. Mm. You know, you take a chimpanzee out of the jungle, it's basically buggered. Whereas Homo sapiens have, have been adapted to live in, you know, all across the planet. Um, and there's something apparently that happened in our, you know, uh, evolutionary development called neoteny, which was when, our species started giving birth to babies that were much less developed. So like a human baby, I mean, I've got a, a 10 month old, I can vouch for this, I love him to bit. You know, when he was born, he can't do anything. He can't feed himself. You know, he's, he's like a blank canvas. So our brains are designed really to be adaptable and different and diverse. Um, and I, I think I would, I, would, I would say that actually whilst I'm saying that our brains were, you know, the same structure hundreds of thousands of years ago, I, my, my guess is that right from that point, we were having that neurodiversity happen. And we were having those big thinkers, those artistic thinkers, because again, no other species really tries to represent something that isn't there. And that's a very human trait. But I just think it, like you say, I think it was happening almost right from the start of Homo sapien existence i would have thought i believe it was the start i believe mm. it was the start yes the yeah. person. i think i believe that the common there was a well, that we there was a common ancestor between us and the chimpanzee mm -hmm. right? and i believe that it was um, millions of years ago and six, six or seven right and and there was that person those individuals lived at the beach um and those individuals the females had had a menstrual cycle and females um, synchronize their menstrual cycle when they live and work in close communities. And the female's menstrual cycle would have been in sync with the moon, with the phases of the moon. So the moon, uh, women's menstrual cycle is 29, 29 days and the moon is 29, 29 days um, on average of light and dark cycles, 29 and a half days. And there's been a question throughout time is does the, does the moon drive the menstrual cycle? And obviously the menstrual cycle doesn't drive the moon. Um, and well, the moon doesn't drive the menstrual cycle, okay? Because um, over the moon has moved, our moon has moved away from our earth. 
And in the distant past, it was closer to our Earth, and therefore the the, the cycle of the moon going around our Earth, um, the, or at least the light and dark cycle, was like 28, 27, 26, 25 days as you keep going back in time. As you go away from the, as we go further in time, it'll go from 29, 30, 31, and, and so on. I believe that at some point in the past, there was a, a unique intersection between the, the cycle of the moon and the, um, being at the same as the women's menstrual cycle, or the, the, this, this, this common ancestor's female menstrual cycle. Okay. And this person, this individual lived on the beach and they learned that they could plan for the future when the high and low tides would be, when there would be more or less food based on the menstrual cycle and the moon. They all came into sync. So the earth and sky became one. Um, this is radical anthropology, I'm gonna tell you right now, just put it out there. Um, <laughs> Science and it, it's, it's radical, but it's, it's, it's so easy. It's so simple to comprehend that the three came. If you ever go down the beach during a low tide, there's a lot of food out there. There's mussels, there's clams, there's seaweed. Um, and you just, you know, super low tide around the, the new and the full moons. And if you are on a, a super high tide, you know, you, you know, you, you got driftwood, right? <laughs> there's no food. <laughs> and so there's the tides determine how much food you have. Um, and so if you could predict when the food would be the tides, um, and then when there was not good food at the tides, you can go off to find berries or something else in the woods. Okay. And so you can be more efficient um, hunter gatherers. So the ability, that ability requires um, an animal to see something to create a clock that really isn't there. Abstract thought. Yeah. It cre abstract thought to think to to think beyond today. So right now, the squirrels, you know, where I live, they're all, they're hoarding nut. They're all putting nuts in the ground for the winter. They're not actually storing nuts for the winter. They're hoarding nuts. They're, they're hoarding nuts. Yeah. And it just because there's lots of nuts in the, the, the life history strategy of the squirrel is is that they it just works out for them. They survive because they can hoard nuts. If, they, if there isn't a place they can't hoard nuts for the winter or something else, they don't survive. Okay. Um, and so the and studies show that squirrels actually forget where the nuts are. <laughs> They're not consciously going, oh, I better put aside some nuts for the winter because it's going to be bloody cold and horrible. They're just, that's what exactly. they do, automatically do it. And the difference between us and this common ancestor with chimpanzee a very long time ago is we had that, we developed that ability through the, through the moon and the tides and the food to develop abstract thinking. Mm. That's the only huge. Thing I, but I wouldn't- no other, As far as we know, no other animal can do that. No, and that's, that's definitely, you know, I think is a huge human trait that just is almost magical in its existence. The only thing I would be tenuous about is it happening that far back because my understanding is that you then had a sort of succession of development to um say for example homo erectus that created some stone tools but didn't mm. didn't have a complex set of tools um and then i would wonder if the first sort of evidence of abstract thought would be uh tool development that was extensive but also um a uh, cave cave art that would for me that would mark abstract thought because it's it's, it's displaying something that isn't you know it's not practical it's not instrumental it's it's abstract but that is only we can only go back as far as what forty thousand years for that is that right so i i would say that all the homos had the ability to do this abstract thought of the the sun i'm sorry the moon the tides and the food sources i suppose homo erectus left left africa so that is an app to me that's an abstract thought in itself of i wonder what's over there like what's going on why would i yeah they he couldn't do that unless he could follow the food and he could predict the food um because yeah. the food within any given region is going to be roughly the same you could follow the the tot for the shoreline and you know for hundreds of miles and it would be roughly the same um the tides with the, with the moon would be the same so i'd say that the, the abstract thought that came after the, the moon um, and the tides or the stars, okay? Because through this, the stars, you can learn to navigate, okay? You can't, yeah. you really can't navigate by the, the, the moon and the, the sun is actually difficult because it moved, it shifts throughout the year. So how you would navigate is by the stars and you choose this, the brightest stars and the, the stars are north, south, east, west, okay? And you choose the stars 
that from an abstract perspective looked like something in your world. So if you looked up to the night sky, actually, here's the question for you. What are five constellations from one, starting at the first one to the fifth one that you could recognize in the night sky? God, I'm terrible with stuff. Well, like you that. know, you start, start off. What's the most recognizable one? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm being influenced by the title of your book, but Orion's belt. Um, so Orion as a constellation, yeah. Because why, why, would, why would you be influenced by Orion? Why would you think that at the top of the list? Because it looks oh, like you. Oh, no, because it's your title of your book. That's why I'm saying. Yeah, that's it. But it also <laughs> looks like you. So before, so Orion as a constellation has a general appearance, the abstract appearance of a human or a chimpanzee or anything else, actually standing. But so we probably, Orion was probably a very early constellation. Mm. Because... And it, it could have actually even been the first constellation. I can imagine some distant point in time when there was the common ancestor us and the chimpanzee stood up to the night sky and said, that is me. Mm. Okay. And so the, I believe that the constellations, um, we started finding constellations in the night sky through things that looked like things in our world. Uh, so we projected our psyche into the, in the cosmos. So we had, so I, I believe our second abstract thought was the concept where the, the stars, because the stars helped us to navigate. They told us where we were through the seasons and help us plan better plan throughout the year versus within one lunar cycle and the, you know, the mm. tides and, and um, the aquatic animals. So I believe the, star, the stars were second. And if we go to the, the, some of this earliest pale of the cave art in Europe that I'm working on, we have Orion. We have him as this, this, um, this cosmic man, this hunter. Um, and we have, they reckon, they, they actually didn't reckon, they weren't interested in the belt stars of Orion. So they were listening to the rest of the stars that looked like a man because people, you know, the belt really doesn't work as a belt, right? You, you slant it down and you're not going to hold up anything. Um, and in, among the ancient Greeks, it was really the, the belt of the held, held sword. Um, mm. So I believe the stars, the stars were second. And then what we did, what we did was we put those constellations onto onto cave walls okay? mm -hmm. to, to as a teaching tool that for an apprentice to show him that him her mostly him possibly her um, what was in the night sky at a different time so one could actually one starts creating a library uh, of, a book of knowledge that says we're, this is what's going this is the story this great story of this myth that's happened that happens around the summer solstice but i'm telling you this story around the winter solstice you know six months um, past in the year so by putting this information on the cave walls with those constellations that were in the night sky during the summer solstice and with the, the life history strategy moments of those animals so you know the stage of the stage of a of an eagle or a Iberian lynx and all these different animals that said this is a summer solstice time period this is not a winter solstice you know there's certain birds there that would otherwise not be there um, migratory birds so they captured a moment and they captured a moment that tells of a great myth of a story of a, a hero's journey from the Iberian Peninsula across south across the Strait of Gibraltar into uh, Morocco, which is of course a huge destination for UK travelers. Um, <laughs> and then back again to the Northern part of the Iberian Peninsula. So we captured a story. We captured a story that we already had in the night sky because the, so to, before we put this on the cables, we had to know the story. We had to be going back and forth. We had to, we had to have all these constellations in our head, all these star patterns. We had to know where all these animals were that became part of those constellations. And where all the geographic points were, the land, the Strait of Gibraltar, and Africa on the other side. So the, the cave art is really a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's really the book of knowledge. After someone had um, tabulated and chronicled and experienced, or many people experienced, all these pieces to then to come together into the cave. So the abstract thinking was fairly well developed, my I would argue, before we even started marking in the caves. Okay. But what that's 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 what I would argue. And what's interesting is that in the one cave, um, um, the gallery disc in, in the cave of El Castillo in Cantabria, Spain, which is 
near the top near Santander. Um, the, I said there's um, this hero takes his journey. Well, on the right side of the panel is north for the, for the artist and the left side is south and the middle of course is you know, in the middle between the two. And all the animals on the right side are distinctly African animals. The animals in the middle are marine animals um, and the animals to the left are African animals. So we have a giraffe, for example, uniquely African animal. There, there, there were giraffes in, in Europe millions of years ago, you know, long, long time ago, but not in um, not 40,000 years ago. Yeah, no, so the, this, this part of the cave artist, for him to have actually drawn this giraffe with, with its distinct characteristics, which we have the mother giraffe, her head's, her head's kind of down and the juvenile's neck comes behind it and then slips under her, the mother's head, protecting her. It's a scene you had to see. If I told you exactly, if I expressed just what I did now and you drew a picture of it, you'd like make, you know, put two horses. If you had never seen a giraffe, you put kind of two horses together with slightly long necks and, um, you know, some sort of spots on them. But you had to have seen a giraffe and you had to see some of the other animals that are depicted on this to, to depict them in the way that they did. Um, and so I would say that the long before we had cave art, we had campfires and around those campfires, we told those stories mm. and we told those stories in, in their, this hero's journey in both the terrestrial world and in the night sky. And that's how we remembered them. How, that's how they became significant. So there, may, so there are many steps. Now there's another nuance to this. In many of the caves, the animals are actually, there, there was already a crack in the rock. Okay. And so the, the artists made that crack into the belly of a horse and then you know, built the rest of it around that. Um, and so I believe that the first art artistic technique, actually, actually first artistic technique, I would say is the, the moon, the, some sort of the moon, the second would be the, the stars. The third one was actually seeing images or pareidolia in um, natural rock formations mm. and then f drawing from them the animals and, uh, and people, which is the essence of being an animist, the same people who believe that, um, you know, the, the stars or people will go to the stars, uh, people, you know, the, the wind has a voice and the, the mountain is real, mm -hmm. um, is a God. So I believe that the geological formations, um, natural geological formations were this other step of abstract art, which we then, when we traveled, we, re, we reinvented that in the caves. So multiple step. I would say that there was multiple steps before we, we got to that point. And that's not even a hard thing to, to, to argue the case for because anthropologists, uh, theologists, you know, it, there's, there's plenty of examples in history and even in the modern day of cultures that have, uh, you know, given spirits to the animals, the trees, the mountains. You know, that's, that's a fairly human trait even now, isn't it, really? Um, of course it is, yeah. You know, I would... it, it, how many of the great prophets climbed a mountain to talk yeah. to the great almighty. Well, even, I mean, you know, um, Native American culture is, is still mm -hmm. full of that, isn't it? You know, so there's even cultures that exist today that still, you know, give spirits to the, the world around us. So I think that's definitely a likely thing. I guess um, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because just to, so when, um, when you, when, um, when we were contacting each other about this, you sent me a link about your work. Uh, sure. which uh, I don't know if you're able to share, but I, I'm happy to put it in the blurb. At the yeah, before Ryan.com. Yeah. Um, and it, it kind of outlined all the stuff that you'd seen in the caves. Um, and it was an interesting one for me because everything you're saying now and everything you're proposing, I, kind of, I, I, can't, um, I can't really argue with it. It's, it's exactly what I think would have been happening. It makes so much sense in terms of humanity and, uh, naturalism as you say mm -hmm. um but when i first saw the video i was looking at it and obviously in the video you'd kind of outlined the pictures so that people sure. could see what you were looking at um and then i and i sort of went and then looked at the pictures without those outlines and i just sort of i'll be honest and sure. i don't think this anymore but i was kind of like ah oh, it's rubbish i can't see it that's mm -hmm. nothing i can't see anything there there's no he's just drawn the picture around it then 
I reminded myself that just because one human doesn't see something, doesn't mm-hmm. do something, doesn't describe something a certain way, that doesn't mean anything. And then right. I read some of your work on neurodiversity mm-hmm. um, and it all, it all kind of connected because that's what, what I do for a living is, is mm-hmm. people with neurodiverse conditions and their families. And, you know, I'm forever going into schools, talking to professionals about the value of neurodiversity you know, how important it is to human culture and development that we had people and have always had people that see things slightly differently. Um, and I guess what oh, I'm going to tell you, it's not slightly, it's drastically differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Almost drastically. <laughs> it's between a different Picasso and an engineer. I mean, people I met with see someone the, the other world day. differently. I met with someone the other day that said that um, they saw me as a yellow and green shape a circle which meant that i probably had some neurodiversity of my own <laughs> which as i mentioned to you i've always mm-hmm. kind of the adhd side of things has struck home for me but um i've never been a visual thinker so for me to see those cave paintings is probably a non-starter i would have gone mm-hmm. to those caves and gone oh look they've made some markings on the wall that's pretty um, <laughs> but i wouldn't have connected those dots but it doesn't mean that they weren't there and again in the Paleolithic era, you would very have likely, as you said, had creative thinkers that sat and pondered the, the moon and the stars and went, or you know, and recognized those details. And you had a, would have had people like me that were running around looking for their next meal and going, well, you know, oh, she's pretty, let's mate with her. You know, mm-hmm. that it's again, it's a di- diverse um, culture, diverse species. But what I would ask, have you met other people? Are there other people that would have seen those images in the cave without you kind of adding in the... Yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah. I test people all the time. Okay. Good, <laughs> I test good. individuals and I test groups. They don't know they're being tested, otherwise they would you know, look at it yeah. differently. And um, it's actually a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, people who are, are described as mathematically oriented, and they, they'll, they typically see the elephant. Okay? The, the elephant jumps out pretty easy. Mm-hmm. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people that are, um, they've made a career in art. Okay? And they'll see, right away, they'll see five or six animals. I've counted one or two, two people that I've seen like right away, more than 20. The same ones that I see in you know, the same way. Um, and so that's, these are two ends of the spectrum. Okay. And then everybody else kind of falls somewhere in the middle. Okay. And, um, so the answer is, is yes. When I give present, if I give a presentation to an astronomy group, which tends to be, they're not people visually looking at the stars from a constellation standpoint, they're interested in physics, okay, math. Mm. I, I will lower the bar on what I present, okay? And if I'm giving a presentation to an art group, I raise the bar, okay? <laughs> I have to do it. And um, so that, so, so I give a challenge to the art people and I connect with the physics people. Mm. Um, and on the physics people, I'll, I'll go talk more about the history of astronomy and, and where, how it went to the Greeks and Mesopotamians and others. And the art people, I'll talk more about the, the concepts of the, the art itself. Um, so I, I, um, I test people all the time and I love giving presentation to, you know, 20, 30 people in the room. And across this, this panel, the, the gallery disc is 10 meters across um, and about you know, four meters high. And across it streams these red discs. Each red disc is about this, on average, the size of the palm of your hand. And there's 90, 90 or so in, in total. And when I start off the presentation, I talk about the red discs because that's what hides the elephant in the room. You know? So it's, it's the... Um, it's a, it's magic. It's a magic trick, right? Um, so I talk about how many red discs can you count, and right away you can see, you know, two. Th- if it's a, if it's an engineering crowd, they all start physics crowd. They all just start counting the red discs. And they start throwing up numbers. If it's an art crowd, you know, a few people count the red discs, and other people would be kind of staring around it. <laughs> and someone will say, you know, well, I'm not interested in the red discs. This, the lines are interesting. And someone will say, that looks like a dog over there, you know. And the dog that they typically see is the lion. It's what pops out pretty quick. Um, and so the, it's, a, it's a test. And we've been taking these tests since we were little kids. In the United States, we have diners. I'm not sure if you have them in the UK. And then the diners have the kids menu. And yes. on the flip side of the kids menu, you have um, in, the set, the, you know, in the center of it, you have 
in the central area, you have, um, you got to find the animals hidden in the jungle or the forest. Yeah. And on the, on the fringes of that, you have, you know, crossword puzzle, maybe some math tests sort of stuff. And some kids like me were drawn to find the animals in, in the jungle. And some kids were drawn to doing the math problems. Okay. So we test ourselves as, you know, very early in life. And um, there's, there's famous artwork that tests this sort of embedded images. Psychologists have something called an embedded figures test. And you have to, it's, it's almost exactly the same as the Pelican Cave art and the, high, and the flip side of the kid's menu, trying to find the animals in the jungle. And they test you how quickly you can find these, these, these um, patterns um, in, in a series of lines. And for me, it all pops up pretty quick. And, but for some people, they would, they would really struggle with it. But the people that struggle with that would be the same pay people that, you know, ace their math, mm. you know, in, in, you know, calculus tests. And um, so there's, we're all different. And Definitely. we radically, not only do we radically see the world differently, but we project the differences to others. Mm. Okay. So picture set, some of the great picture thinkers were, um, are Steven Spielberg. Okay. He, he's projected his mind into the cosmos for us all to see in a radically different way than people had seen before him, before him. Okay. Another, another great uh, picture thinker is Charles Darwin. Okay. Charles Darwin was looking at, was finding patterns. He wasn't a, he wasn't a big math guy. Um, he was, he was finding patterns in the natural world. Okay. Um, through, through, through images of, of the, looking at the differences between the birds um, and the, the other animals in the Galapagos Islands. And of course, dogs and you know, pigeons in, in the UK. So we, we have differences in people. Um, and in today's world, those extraordinary differences in people, when they're exercised, we have these super special um, high performers in their fields. And I believe that's what happened tens of thousands of years ago. You had, you, you, because the, the tribes, the clans are very small. You probably had 20 people, 30 people living together. And so if you had three people with these super abilities and to make sure you had to pass it on, you really had to have about five to 10 in the genetic, the genetic pool. That you, you the, the society was gravitated towards these, these super picture thinkers, these people that could see the constellations that could navigate in time and space because by t navigating in time and space, it told them where and when the food would be and how they would be successful as a people. They also had people who were good at weaving and they're good at people good at hunting and fishing and they had people good at, you know, chopping wood, okay? Um, and so in every society you have a mix of people, but th these in the upper Paleolithic, they had such small clans that they had to have a greater majority to pass on the gene pool of people who can actually do these things. In today's world, we have a smaller percentage and we tend to weed out people who or really truly weed out because the people in the physics and the engineering um, and then we call the executive management world, they don't, they don't see value in the super creative types, except when they go to the movies, except when they go to the museums, um, and except, except when they go to the, the art fairs and, and all these sorts of um, um, musical events. It's almost like culture in the last, I guess, tiny amount of time, the last 10,000 years has shifted to um, favor the more neurotypical person uh, and I guess uh, encourage and support conformity rather than diversity in terms of, you know, perspective, because, uh, well, I don't know why that would be as such, but. Oh, production, 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 production manufacturing, yeah, yeah. Production. Yeah, industry. Yeah. So I, I don't think that we favor the neurotypical person. I think we created what is now the neurotypical person. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think tens of thousands of years ago, it was a different neurotypical person. Yeah, maybe. And also you could argue that the, what, if, if, if you had these sort of isolated tribes that didn't have any of that diversity, they just would have died out because they would just all be doing the same thing. They'd all be good at weaving baskets, but no one's catching the bloody food to put in the basket. Exactly. You know? So it's about production. Mm. It's about keeping people um, uniform, to keep them in line, to keep them marching to, you know, into a production line, marching in the army or whatever, the, to have a, a more common way of thinking. But 
what is what is most um, social that's so that's social you know we don't want people marching in the streets we don't want more, more people marching to an office right um, but what is what gives us life what gives us how we expand our imagination what is truly special about humans is our abstract thinking our ability to create art and that's what differentiates us from all the other animals perhaps not the elephant okay there's some dispute about that but the well, they what paint. makes elephants paint <laughs> yeah so there's i've seen it i believe it there's lots of other people who have seen it and don't believe it okay, okay. so it's a very con- it's very controversial whether or not the the handler is what what part the handler is taking in it right okay it's very controversial um so so i'm going to say with the possible exception of the elephant because mm-hmm. whenever I, if i say it's the the plus the elephant you're going to have all kinds of hate mail and attack because, <laughs> you know, i hate elephants and you know because it has to do with elephants being people so many people do not want elephants captive at all period yeah even though these are all rescued elephants okay but anyways different subject um so it, it is the art in us that makes us special and makes us um you know rules of our domain in a sense but it's also that's how we escape when we go to the movies and the, mm. and, and the theater and and what we, we look at art on our computers we're more captivated by most people are more interested in looking at art on instagram than the mathematical formula um because the art is interesting um and it it draws us in it becomes makes us better than who we are and it it's it's an escape um, equally we're not interested i don't think in art like you don't go to see art that any bugger can do like you, you want to see someone that's looked at something and seen it completely differently you know like someone like monet who would paint like mm-hmm. a field of flowers but the way that it was expressed was just wow i've never visualized yes. it like that so again it's that diversity and uh, there was a there's a lady called temple grandin I don't know, you've probably heard of her. She's an autistic lady who, she wrote a book actually called Thinking in Pictures about the way she thinks visually. Um, And she came out with a brilliant quote. She said, if by some uh, miracle they'd taken autism out of the gene pool, uh, we'd all still be sat around in caves socialising and making small. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so so here's the deal on that. This is my, my perspective. I don't believe that all autistic people are picture thinkers. No, she doesn't know. She changed okay. that. She changed okay. that. However, all dis- I believe that all dyslexic people are picture thinking thinkers because mm-hmm. that's what defines what dyslexia is. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And um, so it's, I believe that these people tens of thousands of years ago, there's a greater percentage of what we would now describe as dyslexia, which, oh, considered, wow. which, which would Dys- now be considered a disorder. Yeah. But it's what enabled us to survive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, by the way, Picasso, Spielberg, Einstein mm. were dyslexic. See that, and, and it was interesting when you were saying about um, you categorized kind of the, the sort of visual thinkers and the mathematical people. And I was thinking to myself, if I'm that kid with that menu, I'm the one that is distracted within five minutes and talking to the person next to them. So we also have, and I would I would probably do very well in, vocabulary tests or you know linguistic so i would never fit dyslexia but actually Mm -hmm. as a result i'm rubbish at observing things at uh spotting art in you know i'm not very visually observant so again maybe back when there was less sort of wiffle waffle and talking and socializing you know like you said there would have been a higher proportion of people that were very visually attuned very attuned to their environment and Mm -hmm very possibly t- t- today pathologized as having a disorder. Um, when exactly. actually they were in a different environment. And I've, I've, I've argued this with ADHD, with autism, with dyslexia. And, you know, I've never thought of it that way before, but yeah, it fits as well. But if you put someone in an environment that makes them, that plays to their strengths and their successes, it's not a disorder anymore. A lot of the It's time. not now. And um, Spielberg's an interesting case because when he was in high school, he had like a C average. And he didn't get into film school. Can you imagine that? <laughs> okay. Can you just put that in perspective? He ultimately did get into film school, but not the film school he was trying to get into. <laughs> they didn't think he had the right stuff. Einstein 
he, he barely made it through um, um, college, technical school, college, what he had at the time, barely made it through and he couldn't get a job. Okay. Uh, he couldn't get a job in the field, so he became a patent clerk, right? Um, so the, these, not the, what happens is once you establish a field, that field becomes one of pushing or maintaining the, the norm or the mainstream. It's not, not about creation, new creation, um, mm. new ideas. And um, it becomes more about administration of, of what is known here. This see, this is so, uh, this is really striking home with me because one of the, like for me, I, I'm now fascinated in early history, ancient history, and particularly prehistory. I dropped history at school mm -hmm. as soon as I could as a subject. Mm -hmm. It bored the hell out of me because they dictated what you had to learn. And at the time, all, I, all we ever used to bloody learn about was King Henry VIII's wives. <laughs> bomb shelters from the second world war and i had no interest in that but so that's a perfect example of a subject where you could have so many free thinkers and people that were exploring whatever they wanted history is literally anything that's ever bloody happened so that could be the freest topic of all it's everything that's ever happened you can yeah. just say to a young person go and study something that's already happened and tell me how you evidence whether it happened and if there's any contradictory evidence and have a look at archaeology, you know. But instead, they dictate it and they administer, you know, they're making it an administration. Um, yeah, education is bollocks. We need to change that. Sorry. <laughs> well, it does. It has changed a lot. Um, part of it is that you can now look at history on YouTube. Great yes. videos. Self um, yeah. from both From both the mainstream academia and from people outside of um, academia. There's a wide range of videos and ranging from two minutes to, you know, three hours. So we have a lot of resources now. We have all these streaming channels on, on TV. Uh, you know, we have Netflix here and Hulu and Amazon, and there's tons of documentaries that are well, extremely well made. And we can, we can capture, you know, a course in what we have a college history, you know, in, in a week of binging on Netflix. Hmm. Um, so we have so many more resources today that we didn't have before. Podcasts are huge. You can't imagine. I mean, um, to have, I've reached between four and 5 million people on long form podcasts. So this is a long wow. form podcast and podcasts having a few thousand hits, um, you know, is most books, new, new books may sell 4,000 books. Okay. Which is, yeah. you know, it's okay. And you can do a long form podcast and easily hit a few thousand people. You can more commonly hit po podcasts that have tens to 30, 40,000 people. And some that go into the hundreds of thousands. And of course, like a Joe Rogan is millions, mm -hmm. but you, you put that as a concept that how we share information has changed so much since we were in school at least since I was in school, I'm 56. Um, and we, we can download books in an instant, um, you know, through Kindle and, and other forms. We have all kinds of, you know, Wikipedia and other media on the, on, the, on the internet that we can get pieces of what we want to know and perhaps explore it further. So I, the model of somebody taking a class in, you know, Chaucer for like four months, two days, oh two days a week for an hour each is absurd. It's absolutely absurd. Um, it because, over here, by the way, that's what happens. We get, you know, <laughs> I happens, yeah. English literature and the amount of Shakespeare and Jane Austen I had to read by the end of it. <laughs> God, just head in, but, uh, I have a niece who has a, he has, she has a master's degree in, in, um, the Canterbury tales. So that's what she has. And wow. she decided she wanted to go to law school afterwards because she just couldn't live the rest of her life teaching the Canterbury tales. No, don't blame her. <laughs> it's in one book. Um, I, I mean, so I, I totally agree. I think that the, the resource that's accessible out there now is amazing. I just, certainly over in the UK, that's not leaking through to the, the education system quick enough. And education system here is still pretty restrictive. And you learn what they decide you should learn, which <laughs> what you should need to know to keep you to keep you essentially in the box. Yeah. Now, this is what I th I think should happen. If I was an executive of um, you know Microsoft or Intel or something like that, I would be reaching out 
for neurodiverse people to sit around the table. And you might have some autistic people that in normal, cir ordinary circles might seem disruptive. Mm -hmm. And you got to say, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Because around that table, they need more ideas, more different ways of seeing the world. They need more Picassos. And Picasso is disruptive as heck, as was Spielberg, as was Einstein. No one gave Einstein a job. And ultimately he did it outside of the system. You know, he basically freelanced, independent, became um, a physicist. And so we have to, as, as um, in industry and in academia, we have to let um, bring people in that don't fit the norm, that don't fit in the box, because by um, because those individuals help to expand all the horizons. Bernie, I, I think that I'm going to end up putting this podcast on not only the, the Bunch of Apes podcast, but I might share it on my BizPod podcast, because that is all about celebrating neurodiversity and, and mm -hmm. you know, some of these things we've spoken about just, you know, really fit that. Um, but I am just conscious that obviously we are, this is Bunch of Apes. Just to manage your expectations, because you were talking about podcasts where you can get up to 40,000 just, just bear in mind we're brand new, so don't don't, don't be disappointed. I'm, I'm oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna increase your numbers. Oh, excellent. Well, I'll be pleased. I'm gonna promote it. Good, good, good. Well, yeah, that, that's all gonna be you. I'm gonna be very grateful for it, but I can't yeah. really put much in the way of return. Um, but just to recap uh, about the, the the stuff that you've been, you know, looking at, discovering, thinking about in the in the in these. Well, camps. I don't think I'm discovering anything. Okay, so these if if someone else created something. I'm unearthing it. I'm not yeah. discovering it. There's a difference, yeah. But is there, just to play devil's advocate, and I have to say, you know, I, I genuinely went through a kind of loop of, oh, I'm really interested in this. Oh, hang on. This is not, this is, you know, just a guesswork. And then actually, even before we spoke, thinking, oh, hang on, you know, maybe I'm just not seeing it. And now mm. having spoken to you, even more convinced that, it's, it just makes sense. Everything you're saying makes sense, even mm. if there's not necessarily uh, undeniable evidence as such. Yeah. Um, but just to play devil's advocate then, um, there are so there are some cave paintings from an earlier time. Uh, I had to Google the name. Um, I think it's 64,000 years ago. Is, yeah so the, okay the, so they're really clear they're really clearly drawn so i guess i'm just sort of devil's advocate would be well why would they be making these big abstract pictures yeah. of rocks when so let's abstract. talk about those are in in, in iberian peninsula spain that's it yeah. um there's a there's there's a lot of dispute over the the dating of those oh really okay, okay. and how it works just really simple is they're actually using the same dating technique that was used for the images I work. These, the, the pellet the KRS were working on limestone walls and calcium carbonate secretes from the, the limestone walls, which can then be dated through a um, uranium series process. So once it comes out of the wall, it, it becomes a datable subject. And if it's if it secretes on top of pellet the cave art, you can say is that's at least the cave art is at least as old as that secretion of the lot of these um, calcium carbonate. Okay? okay, so it's on top of it. Okay, so it, what's happened in the the sixty so called sixty five thousand year old one is that there are multiple flows of calcium carbonate. So mm -hmm. you can imagine a wave coming up on the beach. Um, successive waves come up in the beach, how do you sort out which wave it was? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a, um, the people that are behind that are also are behind the concept of abstract Neanderthal art. That's what they're trying to prove. Yeah. Okay? And so the, the technique, the technique is good, but it's the, the dating is very fuzzy because of which wave is it that came up on the beach? Okay. Um, and in fact, it all mixes together. That's, that's what I mean, I mean, also, I mean, so that's a really good explanation. I didn't know that. But also, I guess the argument that just because one person was painting in a really sort of non-abstract way, really, although it still is abstract because it's not there. So it's abstract thought. But just because they were painting sort of drawings that were exact and not using the rocks around them, that's not really an argument anyway, because, again, 
neurodiversity you would have you don't have two artists that draw things exactly the same so yeah i don't think it's abstract art at all i think that it's a copy of something else what how do you mean it, it's a copy of something else so um for example the, the the case of picasso picasso borrowed two masks from the, the cave of altamira okay mm-hmm. and in the, the cave of altamira the masks were there they're irregular rock formations that the, the cave artists use charcoal um that he put, you know, faces and eyes and other features on them. Okay, so Picasso t- borrowed those images and he put them into Les Dames d'Avignon, and people said that was abstract art. Oh, I see. Okay, but it was ne- but Picasso borrowed from something else that was from a natural formation. The original artist, the cave artist that saw the irregularities and put the faces on it, that was abstract art. It wasn't abstract art. Picasso borrowed someone else's abstract art. And so some, a lot of these images that are being called abstract art, I don't believe they are. I believe that they're copies of somebody, something else. In my book before Ryan, I actually talk about a lot of these geometric formations. I, I believe it's part of a sign language. Okay. Um, I don't believe it's abstract art at all. I also, I actually, even though I don't agree, the, the evidence doesn't support the 65,000 years ago for those images, I have no reason to believe that there were not homo sapiens in Spain or France, 65, 75, 80, or 90,000 years ago. Well, they were. Yeah, we know they were, don't we? So. Yeah, I have no issue with that at all. Um, but I, that there, there's a lot of dispute about those specific images and really motivation behind it that people want to show that Neanderthals made art before Homo sapiens. Hmm. And I believe one of the differences between us and Neanderthals is we didn't make art. Uh, so one by one, these so-called these Neanderthal abstract art ones have been debunked. Um, and I believe the 65,000 one will eventually be the only reason they say, they also say it's the only reason they say it's Neanderthal is they say, we have no evidence that homo sapiens were there. Well, you, one could say that, so assume it is 65,000 years ago. One could say that the evidence is that homo sapiens made the first art and that's our art that we left. So it's, there's a, um, it has you to don't do think, with, You don't think there's a chance Neanderthals could even create abstract art. No, I don't think so, okay. um, because the I, I don't I don't believe that they, they created abstract art in the caves. Yeah. Any art at all? Do you think there was a chance they would? Because I know there was. There's lots of evidence for, like, say, interbreeding. There's there's certain yeah. evidence for uh, later development that may have been influenced by observing Homo sapiens. So, would it not maybe? Would there be a chance? I mean, no. So most of the most of the art that people are saying is abstract art runs between thirty five and forty thousand years ago is when we have a lot of Homo sapien art. Um, mm-hmm. Now, did 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 um, Neanderthals take a shells and string them, put them around their necks? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Is that is that abstract art? I don't know. You know, um, they they likely traded. What did they trade? They did make. Um, they, they, they created like a, when they created their, um, their tools, they had a, they made blanks. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then they, and then they, they made the, uh, you know, the, the shape, the, the, the sharp edges from those same blanks. Is that abstract art? I don't know. Um, I guess it's not, I guess we're, we're maybe we're, I'm, I'm confusing myself with the definitions because abstract yeah. art is different from abstract thought and yeah. the process of being artistic to me is abstract thought because you are you're sharing something that doesn't exist it's not basic it's not instrumental it's it's for the purposes of nothing else other than creating it and i would i would say i i personally would think that neanderthals possibly did do that but i get what you're saying in that they wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily have then created abstract art of things like stories and things that didn't exist and and journeys that happened in the past but they could have yeah. still i think they had i think they had the moon and the tides and how to figure out how to ke- um, plan for plants and animals yeah but if we if they had abstract art we'd see a lot of it they were in europe for 150 20,000 years before we were where's yeah. all the art i mean we be we should be seeing a lot of art not just one or two one or two offs that overlap when homo sapiens were or could have been there it's amazing though, isn't it? Because they, they know that there was some sort of interspecies breeding. So I guess you would have had offspring that. Yeah, the interspecies breeding was about 35, 20, uh, 30 to 35,000 years yeah. ago. So again, maybe you, could you have had then a group of 
sort of half breeds, if you like, cross breeds, um, where they might have created some art. And for us, looking back at the evidence, they'd be in just, we wouldn't be able to tell if they were Homo sapiens or Neanderthals anyway. Well, I would, I would argue the answer is yes, that Neanderthals would have, would have given us capabilities that we otherwise didn't have. Um, and vice versa, I suppose. And vice versa, yeah. But obviously, we didn't give enough to them because they died off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you say that, but as I said, you know, Sloping Briar Ridge, you know, it's been said in lots of times. Um, well, you could also have some sort of Nordic background too, right? Yeah, and well, then, I'd like to Nordic than bloody Neanderthal, but I do tend to get Neanderthal. <laughs> no, you, if I saw you on the street, I wouldn't think Neanderthal. I think, you know, that's some sort of Viking that, you know, spent some time in the UK. See, that's what I knew I should get. It's good to get you on the podcast, Bernie, because that's, that's a hell of a compliment. I, I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, just go. I, you're, you're probably... Did you ever do like a 23andMe or something like that? Test? I did. I did a my deal or whatever it was. So get this. I spent um, I spent 79 quid, which is about the same as dollars nowadays anyway, on, yeah. on the... Uh, was it my... Is it my heritage? Which apparently is not a very good one anyway. Did that. And got all excited, and I love Vikings, so I was like, "Oh yeah, please be Viking!" Come yeah. On. Got my test back. Ninety-two percent British and Irish. What a waste of time that was. So basically, my ancestors have not left anywhere. They probably just were born up the road. Millions. <laughs> Who knows? They came from someplace, okay? And uh, so the you're, yeah, the Neanderthals probably. Well, <laughs> so they they came from they came from someplace. And they could have come from the same place originally. How the, these tests work is where's the greatest like population of what yeah. you have in you, and that's the place that they say you originate from. Well, so, what, so how the test could work? How the test could work? I can tell you, is that there's probably more Irish in Bo around Boston than there is an entire country of Ireland. Okay, right. Uh, and so, one could actually look at the test and say, well, you know, we Irish all came from from Boston. <laughs> okay. oh, yeah. And so what your test is saying is that the greater percentage of the people with your background currently live in the UK. Right. So okay. I'm just it British. That's, that's kind of works. So my test, I, I did one and it, and I have um, um, German Lithuanian on one side, uh -huh. which it showed up in the test. And then I, I have Irish, um, I have Scottish and English on the other side. Uh -huh. Okay. Now the, the Scottish side, it also put a footnote in there that your, your Scottish genes also have a high density of the people we would call Berber or Amazon in North Africa. Okay. So where do I come from? Do I, do I, my, my people come from North Africa, the Amazon people, the yeah. Berbers, or do we, or those people come from Scotland? <laughs> right. So this, so the, you have to, Quite the tests, the not. tests skew you towards where your people most mostly migrated to. Yeah, where okay. they ended. <laughs> That's kind of how. I, mean, it I read. Works. I read somewhere that actually, depending on which one you get tested as well, it just tells you that you share the same DNA or the, the DNA from most of the people in that country that did your particular test. They don't even share data. That's what I heard, but which is a little bit concerning. That's exactly how that works, yes. Right, so basically was... I'm 88 or 92% the same as people that live in Britain and do the my heritage test. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Very little about anything, to be honest. But If I they did... were selling that same test in, the, in, um, in Norway and Sweden, it might have some different results. Maybe, maybe. Well, I did have 0.9% Papuan as well, so that was very strange. Papua, what's that? Papua New Guinea. You have Papua New Guinea. So what that means is, Britons, some Britons went to pe people from your heritage went to Papua New Guinea, and that shows up in the test. Or one of my very, very, very early ancestors, maybe a great great grandmother, uh, you know, got a little bit familiar with someone that had come over on the boats or something. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, it's possible. <laughs> um, or you got a blood, or you you know maybe you got blood someday, some time in the past from Papua New Guinea, uh, someone found. But it's yeah, it's it's kind of um, they tell you it's it's a snapshot. Yeah, it's, and you it's, know I'm gonna go with the Berber Amazon people from from Morocco. 
That's Black it. Well, that's what everyone does, isn't it? They do these tests and they take the bit that's coolest. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, Bernie, I've, I've kept you for over an hour. So, uh, well, it was fun stuff. We'll have to do it again. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get you back on because, you know, I, I think we, we almost went all over the place with it, which is fantastic. But again, I'd, I'd like to get you back on and just talk more about the, the actual um, details of your work and, and sure. you know, what that is and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, I will let you go for now and just thank you ever so much for your time. Um, and for everyone listening, um, if you want, actually, so Bernie, just to, just so that you get something out of this, where can people find out about you? Where can they buy your book? You know, where, where do they go to get your work? Well, actually, I got something out of this by speak, um, connecting with the great Sam Harris, um, not who is app. known all around the world as yeah, a neat. neuroscientist. And, and uh, another so, bloke. <laughs> that was fabulous. So if people want to learn more about my work, beforeorion.com, and I use Before Orion on everything. So Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, Facebook, um, just everywhere the social media, you can find me and you can follow my work and however you follow social media. So, mm -hmm. you know, join the party and um, let's go on a journey. Before Orion, before Orion. And I, I, I can't lie and say I've actually read it yet, but it is on my two, uh, is it on Audible, Bernie? Because I listen to books mainly. Well, so. actually, that's good. Actually, I do Audible too. Um, but I do it as, I have a Kindle and the Kindle has a read back for books. Okay. That you right. don't, so Audible costs about twice as much as a Kindle book. Um, right. And so the, I listen to the, the Kindle books and has a, a lovely female voice that seems to catch all the inflections of the verse. Oh, excellent. I say so I can, cause I've got a Kindle app on the iPad, so I can just do it that way. Fantastic. Fantastic. It was a pleasure. Let's do it again. Definitely. And um, for those of you that are listening, uh, the email address bunch of apes at gmail.com. If you've got any questions, ideas, uh, people you'd like me to try and get on. If you are someone that would like to come on and talk about, Basically, anything to do with prehistory. We're on. Um, we're also on Twitter, a bunch of apes, and uh, I. Well, so we're on, there's a Facebook page, so yeah, like, follow, share. It will really help. Uh, and thank you for listening. <laughs>